It's great to see you today. So thankful that you're here. We're going to start off our service this morning with some folks that want to place their membership with our congregation here. And uh, you'll know them by face, I'm sure, and I'll help you with their names. This is Jen Grassball and her children, Lily and Duke. And uh, they come from the Central Christian Church in Mount Vernon. Been attending here for quite a while now. And Jonathan Ferris, he comes direct from Kentucky. And if you don't believe that, you just talk to him for a minute. <laughs> so we're really thankful that they've chosen to place their membership with us. And what that means is they are uh, born again, baptized believers in Jesus Christ. They want to affiliate with our congregation, begin serving alongside of us, uh, hold each other accountable along the way and encourage each other in our faith. So we're really glad that they want to do that. And I'll start with Jen. Jen, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I do. All right. And Jonathan, do you believe the same, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I do. All right. Well, let's, uh, 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 let's go ahead and stand together. We'll stand together as a church family, and we just love being able to repeat that together. And uh, just repeat after me. I believe... That Jesus, is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Living God. All right, well, let's pray, and then we'll turn it over to Chris. Father, we give you praise. You are a holy and an awesome God, and we're thankful for each person that is here today, young and old. Father, those that have made the commitment and choice to worship you today in spirit and in truth. And we pray for Jen and her children. We pray for Jonathan and for all those here, Lord, that are committed to serving you. May we advance and grow the kingdom according to your will. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, praise God. It's great to see Millwood grow in the way it is. We'll begin this morning with a song you guys learned last month. It's called Firm Foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. As I put my faith in Jesus, cause he never let me down. He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? He won't, He won't, He won't fail, He won't fail, He won't, He won't, He won't fail. on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through rain came wind blew my house is built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it 
make it through Cause I'm standing strong on you I'm gonna make it through Cause our house is built on you Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad Cause I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail He won't fail Let me tune my guitar real quick. I think it's out of tune. Okay. We want to do everything in excellence, so out of tune guitar is not excellent. You stood before creation Eternity in your hands You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my failures Carried the cross for my shame. My sin laid upon your shoulders. My soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? But to offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation, spirit alive in me. This life to declare your promise, my soul now to stay. So what can I say? What can I do? But to offer this heart, oh God. Completely to you. What can I say? What can I do? But to offer this heart, oh God, completely. Raise your voices to him. So I'll stand 
with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrender all I am is yours I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrender all I am is yours lift it up I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrender all I am is yours all I am is yours so what can I say what can I do but to offer this heart oh God completely to you what can I say what can I do Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. For our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope, bring us strength, help us go in this world where we roll, oh, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. They have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith handed down to this sage came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the ancient words of Christ. Martyrs' blood stain each page. They have died for this faith. Hear them cry through the years. Oh, heed these words and hold them dear. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. 
Oh, let the ancient words in part. I didn't know there's another one up here. Sorry. <laughs> when I seen I had communion meditation today, I thought I was going to go to the dictionary and see exactly what meditate means. And it says to become absorbed in thought or to ponder. And with my imagination, I thought about the early church, the church within the first few weeks after Pentecost or the first few months, and I tried to imagine what kind of things that they might ponder as they took the Lord's Supper. And, and I pictured the people, many of them would have seen Jesus. Maybe there would have been those that had seen him on the cross. Maybe there were those who there within that congregation that might have been healed by Jesus by a disease or maybe the demon possessed or maybe the lame or the blind. And these people, I believe that when they took the Lord's Supper, they did not take it lightly. There's no doubt. Um, and, and I thought how we, even though we have not actually seen Jesus, he has done no less for us than he done for them. The main thing Jesus done for these people that I imagine in the early church, he gave them the opportunity to have eternal life because of his death and his blood. We should not take that lightly either. If you feel that you don't really take this as serious as you should, or maybe you think, well, maybe I don't see this quite like those people would have back then, spend some time in the scriptures and get to know Jesus, and that definitely will help. Like I said, uh, Jesus done no more for them than he has done for us. So I would like to read in Luke's recording of the Last Supper, When the hour had come, he, being Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that it has been some 2,000 years since this event happened that I just read about. But Lord, we know that for those people, what you had done for them in the early times of the church, you have done for us. Lord, we know that you had said that you went away to prepare a place for us, and that is all of us, and we we're thankful for that. Lord, we, as we gather, we proclaim, um, we proclaim your death until you come back. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for our salvation. And we thank you for this time of remembrance of your son. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.
lies, murder or deception, defilement, victim power, abandoned to die for a government that deceived him, guilty once caught, loss of a child, military spouse, a note carrying a death sentence, a prophet condemning a king, a political scandal that no one wanted to believe, a conspiracy theory that was proven to be true. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. Second Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him and he laid with her. Now she was purifying herself from her uncleanliness, and then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent David and told him, I am pregnant. A few things to note. David is at this point where he should be out in battle. Instead, he sends someone else. And during the working hours of the day, he is with He's taking a nap on the couch. He sees Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. Later on in the story, we see that David is concerned at the news that Bathsheba is pregnant. So what he does is he writes on a note, sends it to Joab, the general that he sent into battle in his place. And he said, send Uriah the Hittite into the front line of the most vicious battle. And there Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba dies. Everybody didn't know this at this point. The only people this was between was Bathsheba and David. However, God knew. And God sends the prophet Nathan to David. And Nathan, being afraid of his own murder, goes to him and he comes up with this story. He says, in a city, there are two men. A rich man that has everything he wants and a poor man that has one little sheep. And this rich man was going to offer a lamb. And despite having everything he could have needed, despite having several sheep, he took the poor man's lamb that grew up with him since a youngling, that was acquainted with the family that ate in their house with the same food. And he took this young lamb and he killed it. And David said, well, that's That's awful. Who would do such a thing? That man ought to be killed. And Nathan says, you art the man. And David understands what he has done and how the story applies to his life. And despite at this moment repenting, the death of his son and Bathsheba's son is still around the horizon. David was in the safest place that he could have been. He should have been in war. And let me note that this is a much more comfortable David than we see earlier. This is not the David who was neglected by his father, who was belittled by the brothers, and still went out running into the front of the war to kill Goliath. David has changed. He is simmered down. And now we see David napping in the working hours of the day in his palace, despite... um, being in what many would call a perfect life with very little pulling at him, he made arguably one of the biggest mistakes of his life. And we often blame outlying conditions for our inner condition. The rich may try to use the excuse, well, I don't want to be an enabler, so I don't give. The poor may say, well, if I had more money, then I would help everybody 
I knew while they rack up debt on wants instead of needs. The young may say, if I just had control, things would be ran differently. And the old may say, well, I've served my years. It's time for somebody else to carry the torch. David was in a situation where he had zero pressure, zero outside influence, zero demands, and yet he still failed. And this teaches us an incredibly important lesson. That is that there is no excuse for our wrongdoings. There is no excuse for our wrongdoings. We are responsible in this world for our reactions, not the environment that we find ourselves in. And though we have general control over where we go, how long we stay there, who we hang out with, even in seemingly safe environments, temptations can arise. David is at his home, at the highest point of his palace, and he's taking in the sunset view that's painting a beautiful picture on the back of all of his accomplishments. Maybe this was a place that he went to de-stress. This could have been a place that he went just to reminisce or to get away from the world. He goes up to this safe place in his house, and there he sees a beautiful woman bathing. We are responsible for our reactions and not for our environment. There are a lot of questions that theologians throughout the years have tried to answer when it comes to this story. Some of the theologians you might read will often say that David was the patriarchal oppressor and he was forcing himself on Bathsheba. And just when that wasn't enough, he went out and had her husband Killed. Why other theologians will say that Bathsheba was bathing publicly because her high-ranking military spouse simply wasn't enough. And she was trying to lure David in through a power grab. But what I have yet to see is a commentator say that both David and Bathsheba were God-fearing followers. And both of their seemingly innocent actions, staying behind to run the kingdom while the war is taking place, and also bathing in a spot that is mostly secretive, however, has one view from David's uh, tower that is um, able to be seen, seemingly uh, secretive. But truth of the matter is, is that I think David and Bathsheba were just like us. I think that they were people who were as a whole determined to follow God, but weren't fully attentive, and at just the opportune time, Satan attacked both of their lives, and in the blink of an eye, their lives were changed forever. And in that way, this story is for us, because this story, though it might sound extreme, isn't just for people in extreme situations. This story is for people like all of us, who as a whole... We're following God, but we have weak spots and we have places that we're not paying attention to in our own lives. And that's where Satan will attack. And just like David, in those small areas of our life, we can have an entire chapter in our life written and dedicated to our failures. So it's important to remember When our environment triggers, tempts, or just plain irritates, we are only responsible for ourselves. Handling these things with an even temper and patience that comes through the Spirit during these moments isn't a sign of weakness, and it's not even a sign that the person who has done this to you hasn't done anything awful. Sometimes we think that if we don't act over the top and pretend or or show everybody that we are a victim, somehow they're going to get away with it. And that's not the case. But rather, we need to be like God in those moments. Be willing to take some of the heat, have patience, and have love. Because ultimately, that's what brings people back. Romans chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice the same things, yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume... On the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Repentance comes through kindness and patience. That's how God has gotten all of us to repent. And that's how we need to handle when we are the victims in situations. We need to respond with kindness and patience so that they can repent. And another important note that we can learn from this ugly story being recorded is that we do not get to pick and choose 
the examples that best represent us. I remember in high school, and maybe you look back in high school, and oftentimes on the first day of the year, the new school year, they will have people do some sort of orientation thing to get to know one another. And this particular teacher, the way they did that is they would have us all meet in the middle of the classroom, and they would give us a statement or a question. And if we agreed with it, we would go to one side of that class. And if we disagreed with it, we would go to the other side of the class. And the statement, I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but it was something along the lines of, we are our truest self when we're not around people that are leading us away. And I didn't necessarily have an overly strong feeling, but I remember disagreeing with that. So I went to the disagreement side, and as I turned around, I realized I am the only one in the class that has disagreed with this. And I didn't really know why. Um, but I remember thinking something along the lines of, there is no such thing as our truest self. There's no such thing as our truest self. Uh, the me that acts a fool in one environment is the same me that acts like an angel in an easier environment. I can't take everything I did and somehow push all the bad examples off to the side and divide them from the good things I've done. But rather, I am fully responsible for both the good and the bad. And both of those things are who I truly am, like it or not. And if we don't repent from the bad, that is still a part of who we are. We can't divide those bad things from our identity, but Jesus can if we repent. And the Bible doesn't hide the good from the bad or the bad from the good. Think of Noah. Noah preserved mankind through building the ark, and immediately he became drunk and had to curse one of his sons for something that was his fault to begin with. Think of Abraham. The man who was friends with God lied so that his life could be saved, even though it meant that his wife would have nearly been violated. Think of Moses, who led the Israelites out of the wilderness, out of slavery, and wandered around for 40 years to find a home, and he wasn't able to inherit it because of his impatience. Think of Samson, the strongest man to ever live, but he used his power to chase his own desire. And he was destroyed by a small woman named Delilah. David, the man after God's own heart, slayer of giants, friend to the misunderstood, violates a woman, murders a hus her husband, and repents after his child with Bathsheba was taken to be with the Lord. And the Bible even knows our own ugly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through the first part, verse 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. The Bible knows the bad even in our own life. And we are not only known in the Bible, but also known by others and God for everything we do despite our reasoning. David probably tried to justify his actions in his mind saying something like, Well, I deserve to be happy. Well, I wouldn't even have to consider this if my spouse... Dot, dot, dot. Well, I will just ask for forgiveness later. Well, God wants me to be happy. It's just business. Well, everyone else does it. At least I don't. At least I'm not. Well, it's my only vice. Or my favorite. Well, you're not perfect either. God can see through situations in ways that we can't. He knows the reason and sees what is driving people. But he also sees the pride, the craving of the body, and the lust from our eyes that try to justify our injustice. We can't hide from God during our sin. He sees through the excuses, and that's just what they are. It is logically impossible to justify injustice, and that's what sin is. It's injustice against a holy and perfect God. So our reasons 
for doing wrong are no more than excuses for not doing what is right. And God will hold us accountable for every single one of those unless we let go of it, leave it in the hands of God, and turn around through doing what the Bible calls repentance. But don't think that repentance is the impossible call to be perfect. Repentance is about pursuit, not perfection. Let me say that again. Repentance is about pursuit, not perfection. Repentance, biblically, the word literally means a 180 change. If you're facing that way, you turn around and begin facing that way. If you're doing this thing, you turn around and you begin doing something else. I like what one preacher said about repentance. He said, repentance is a change of mind that is so deep, the body has no choice but to follow. Jesus and the apostles, elected by God, nearly 50 times in the New Testament warn his people to repent. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. It's a story that you'll be familiar with with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, so if you're offering a gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And what that teaches us when he says, if you made it all the way to the destination of worshiping God and you remember that there's one thing in your past that you've not dealt with, turn around and go deal with that. That tells us that repentance is necessary before worshiping God and necessary before becoming a Christian. But once again, don't misunderstand that to think that repentance is perfection because repentance is pursuit, not Perfection And Jesus can help us to repent. Jesus is for the life change and he just needs our will. You don't wait to go to the gym uh, or you don't wait to lose weight before going to the gym. You don't wait until you are hydrated before you take a drink of water and you don't clean up before taking a shower. So don't think that you have to be perfect and you have to have everything in your life figured out before coming to Jesus. It is a process. The only thing you need to do is change your mind. And though there are sometimes immediate changes that can and should take place very very early on in a Christian's life, the very first thing that needs to change is our mind. That's where it starts because no matter how long in this game you've been, we will never be perfect. So our mind has to at least be set on Jesus True repentance isn't perfection, it's pursuit. It's setting Jesus as the prize to be won, the ribbon to be crossed. It's making Jesus our hyperfixation, our obsession. Those strings, those hang-ups that, wrestle, that we wrestle with will slowly break and fade away as long as we are focusing on him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If this verse tells us anything, it tells us a lot of things, but in this context what we need to know is that we repent because of him and through him. He is the founder and the perfecter. If you've been trying to live the Christian life and be perfect by yourself, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. The only way Christians can truly pursue God, and by the way, let me add, there is more to pursuing God than just the way we live. But if you are trying to pursue God and you find yourself failing over and over and over again, you've got to do it through Jesus. He is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. We can't make our faith perfect. Only He can. And the Bible would use a word called sanctification. And it's always a slow process. And we won't always meet our goals on the first attempt. Cameron Haynes, who's known um, within the archery community as the best archery elk hunter to exist. Period. End of sentence. He tells a story about his first elk archery hunt. And he went out there and within the first little while he saw an incredibly massive 7 by 7 bull, which in the elk world is a big bull. And he pulls back, puts the, the needle on it. Arrow flies through the air. 
His heart's pounding. He's watching it. And as it gets ready to sink into this pool, it lands nearly seven feet short, which in the archery world is bad. That's bad. Um, actually, if, you're, if you have a doe tag and you, or a cow tag and you get a bull, that's a felony. That's how bad it is. Um, incredibly off, seven feet off on his first opportunity. But he was determined that he wasn't going to give up there. He said, I'm not leaving here without a bull. So he stays out in the wilderness unprepared for this long of a hunt for 18 more days. Not having the resources, not having ever done a hunting trip that long. He stays out in the wild for 18 more days to finally kill a small spike bull, which is something that nobody would ever brag about. But for him, this was monumental in that this was a place where now he knew I can do it. It is possible for me to do it. Now I just have to get more consistent. And since then he has. He is the only archery elk hunter in the world to hold a 100% consistency rate. The national average is 10%, which is one guy every 10 years or 10 guys, but only one of them actually get it every year. He has grown, he's known now as the best, but he had to start somewhere and grow from that moment. And repentance is a lot like that. You're not going to hit home runs every single time, but you can grow in that area. Certain areas in our lives may take a lot of time to change, and we're not always going to land those home runs, but spiritual disciplines, I would argue, take just as much, if not more, practice and determination than any sport you can think of in school you've got to work at it and as disappointing or deflating as this truth may be some temptations will never get easier we just need to grow stronger I sat in college one time and one of our professors who was the oldest professor at that point uh, brought in some of his other preaching friends who were also old and uh, they're all sitting around talking and uh, as they're talking, they're the, it wasn't the point of the class, but it, it arose. They were talking about lust. And here all of us young college guys are thinking, okay, you know, we're, they're going to tell us how you know, lust and all that stuff just gets easier with time. And eventually it's not a problem. And they were talking. They said, you know, it doesn't get easier. If anything, I think it's gotten harder for me. And they're talking about this and we're like, What? How can it be harder? And, and they said it's just as hard as it was when they were in high school. And I remember thinking, well, then there's no hope. If there are certain battles that you always have to fight, then there's no hope. Yet, on the flip side of the coin, here were all these men, and I'm going to put the age on it, so now you know what I think is officially old, in their 80s. All these men in their 80s, and they're talking and none of them were watching porn. They weren't committing affairs and they weren't flirting with the young pretty waitresses. These were men, despite having temptations and maybe even having them grow over years and having to wrestle with them their whole life, they were faithful. They didn't learn how to get rid of that vice, but rather they learned how to live faithfully around it. And that's the encouragement that all of us need through the Holy Spirit training for mature spiritual consistency, no matter what our temptation in this world may be. And then finally, I want you to remember, God's grace is bigger than our mistakes. God's grace is bigger than our mistakes. David was a complete mess up. The Bible shares the ugly with David because without seeing how messy we are at times, we would never be able to look up and appreciate how good he is. And we all have stories that we could look back in our life like David and wonder, why me? I guarantee every single person in here has some sort of event, some sort of story, some sort of joke, some sort of whatever it might be that if we shared up on the big screen this morning, you would hang your head low. Guarantee it. We all have that. And sometimes those things get us, uh, get in our way of serving God and, and wanting to grow in our life and, and our businesses and our families and different areas that make us who we are. And so we just hold back. I don't want to get in that position if they found out I did. I don't want to have a family. What if I mess up like 
I don't want to start my own business. What if that means? There's so many areas in our life that are handicapped and hindered purely because of things that are in our past. But God's grace is huge. And God uses the weak things of this world. And every Christian in this building right now and across the globe is privileged to be a part of the weak things. We are all the weak things. And just because we're forgiven and we've changed doesn't mean those consequences of those sins uh, go away. David still lost his son because of what he did. Uh, and he has still talked about thousands of years later. And I'm sure on a social level, there's some reoccurring issues in David's life. He was a murderer, though he was forgiven. And I believe that God is better and easier at forgiving us often than a lot of people that we know. And sometimes the hard truth, even ourselves. Sometimes God forgives ourselves easier than we forgive ourselves or our husbands or our spouse or our children forgive. And we just have to remember that God's grace is bigger than our mistakes. He sees beyond that. If we repent, he sees beyond that. So when we turn our hearts and our minds and our hands and feet to Jesus... God can turn us into Christians like David, who had a heart after God. So let me say a few things here. You can be forgiven even if you have been caught in your sin. You can be forgiven even if your sin has ruined your reputation. You can be forgiven even if your sin has hurt those around you. You can be forgiven even if you tried to cover it up and failed. You can be forgiven even if you abused your position of power. So David makes a song about this chapter of his life. And you might wonder, how does a lustful, murderer, affairing, conspirator respond to the invite of God's mercy? And he says this in Psalm 51, verse 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God, my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. God's grace is bigger than our mistakes. And if we want to be on a path that leads us to God, we can't be on a worldly path. God can't be found on the path of this world. Because the path of this world is hatred. It's getting even. It's victim, oppressor mentality. The path of this world will not lead you to the merciful, righteous God. We have to go through his word, and we have to go through his son, and we have to do it through his spirit. That is the only way we can possibly live a good, and I put that in parentheses, a good Christian life. Thinking of how big of a mess up David was gives me a lot of hope. If you'd stand with me, you think of David, all the things he's done, and his first years were better than his last years, but he makes it right. He repents before the Lord. And on his deathbed, <clears throat> he passes away. And later an epitaph is written about him. And it has nothing but good. And the Bible afterwards, nothing bad's mentioned of David. And he's known as the man after God's own heart. Not because he was perfect. Not because he had it all figured out. Not because he had the right family. Not because he had the right environment. But because he had a heart that he was willing to give over to God and repent before the Lord. This morning, if you need to do that, we invite you, if, if you're a Christian, 
and, and you realize there's some things that I don't have right and I've not been doing this the right way. I'm trying to do it through myself. I'm trying to do it through other things. I'm using other outlets. Try through Jesus. Try through Jesus. And if you're not a Christian, we want to give you an invite to become a Christian and know that there's a body here of sinners such as you that will help you along that process. So pray with me if you would. Father in heaven, we thank you for the God that you are. You are good, you are holy, and you are loving. Lord, we uh, come to your throne boldly, knowing that through your Son that we can have life and that you can be our Father. God, help us to always appreciate you and help us to appreciate you through the way we live and not continuing in sin so that we can make your, your grace grow every day, but rather trying to humble ourselves before you and pursue you with our hearts and our minds every day. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. us this morning and uh, the first thing today is uh, right after service we have a congregational meeting so if you're a member here and you want to know where the church is going and the different things uh, today we're going to be voting on the budget if you'd like to be a part of that you're interested in that we invite you to stay for that afterwards for members and then the next thing here is November 12th there's going to be a Thanksgiving meal and the Thanksgiving meal is a great opportunity. If you have a home um, that maybe isn't ideal for inviting friends, inviting neighbors, whatever it might be, to a Thanksgiving um, meal, but you have the desire in your heart to do that and bring people in some sort of family-type environment, this is a great time for that and also for us as a church family to get together and just be able to um, be thankful and you know, thankful for some good food and amongst other things. Uh, and then the next thing is November 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. There's going to be a Surviving the Holidays um, grief share session. This is one session. It's just to help get anyone that's uh, gone through anything that uh, has brought them grief to help them through the holiday times with whatever that might be. So if you're interested in that, you can see Ernie, you can see Joe, um, or you can sign up in the back. And then also, I just want to encourage you, always look through the bulletin. You can go to our social media pages, our website, or the back to see different people, uh, how to help, how to serve, and uh, grow in the community at the church here. That being said, bow your heads with me, and we'll continue in prayer. Dear Lord in heaven, I pray that we will continue to fight the good fight, finish the race that you have set before us, and keep the faith. I pray, saints, in Jesus' name. Amen.